So this is question number five for the 2018 Chemistry VCAR exam. Um, this one's worth 11 marks and it looks like it's about HPLC because I can see some nice peaks here and some retention times. So looking at this, we've got some information about HPLC. I'm just gonna go straight to the question and work out what I need to know. So identify the substances responsible for each peaks Q and R. So I need to then find out my retention time and match it up to the retention times in my list here. So Q's here, so let's have a look at it. This is 18, massive scale here, which is really frustrating. Halfway between these two is about here, so that's gonna be about 12. Halfway between these two here is about here, and that's going to be, what's halfway between that? It's 14 here. All right, so therefore it's just above 14. So what's just above 14 here? Looks like this one is glucose. So Q equals glucose. And then R, let's have a look, halfway between this, these two is about, around about there-ish, I think. All right, so what's that gonna be? That's gonna be 20. So it looks like it's just below halfway. So, or bang on halfway really, is it? Let's have a look. It's either gonna be this or this. It wouldn't be 18, because 18 is gonna sit around about here-ish. So I think it's gonna be um, glycerol. So R will be glycerol. The most important thing here is whenever you get a scale, bang in the halfway mark. So bang in the fact that that's four, bang in the fact that that's gonna be, um, 28 and then for you're going to be able to work out a bit closer to what your range is annotate your graph as much as you possibly can so that's going to be for part a part b um let's have a look at this one we've got two substances having different retention times under identical conditions explain the difference in retention time so why do we get different retention time this question is an explain question. It's worth three marks. I'm going to put three dot points straight away. I've got a whole bunch of spare paper here as well, which is nice to do some working out if I need it. But, so explain the difference in retention time. Retention time comes from attraction to stationary and um, mobile phases. So um, retention time um, comes from uh, substances being attracted to the mobile phase and stationary phase uh, different amounts. All right, where does this different attraction come from? Well, it comes from the intermolecular forces. Um, substances can um, form intermolecular forces with the stationary phase. All right, so therefore we're going to talk about where these forces come from. Um, these might be H-bonds or dispersion forces. Um, where possible, explaining what my intermolecular forces actually are. Now the two substances that we're kind of talking about I think might refer to Q and R. So let's have a look at the Q and R. Q has a um, shorter retention time than R. So what that means is that Q has been attracted to the mobile phase more than R has been, or alternatively, R has been attracted to the stationary phase more than Q has been. So let's go back and let's go explain that then. So the difference in retention times for these two compounds Q has had a greater attraction to the, what was it? It's shorter retention time, so it's been attracted to the mobile phase um, than R has. Now what I'm gonna have a look at is, do we have, um, an understanding of what these phases actually are. So what is our mobile phase and stationary phase? I don't think this one is talking about what polarity these things are. So therefore we can't say that Q is more polar, so therefore it does that, because we don't know what the stationary phase actually is. But I might say that this different attraction here, which I haven't actually talked about much, is to do with polarity. So um, the different um, attractions 
slash intermolecular forces come from the difference in polarity of the compounds. And ideally, I would probably try and explain what the difference in polarity would be, but for this question, it doesn't look like it needs to. So let's move on, because I think I've got, well, I've got at least four dot points there, which should cover me explaining these retention times. Um, anyway, so let's look at part C. Uh, lots of information here. Um, let's just go to the question again, and let's focus on that. So calculate the percentage by mass of ethanol produced from the mass of cellulose in, found in this, assuming that the density of that. So I need percentage by mass. So percentage by mass of ethanol from cellulose. So percentage by mass will be my mass of ethanol divided by the thing it's coming from, which is my mass of cellulose. So let's have a look at the question again. Um, this stuff, which I've no idea, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, but anyway, is a type of grass that is approximately 37% cellulose by mass. So therefore, numbers, important numbers that I'm probably going to have to factor in. This stuff is being researched as a feedstock for bioethanol production. The cellulose in this grass can be produced, yep, so that's fermentation, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, HPLC can use... Uh, yeah. Researchers use a percentage by mass produced. Using HPLC, a researcher determined that 144 litres of ethanol, and I've got a density, so I convert that to mass of ethanol, was produced from that many grams, kilograms of that. Alrighty. So therefore, if I need my mass of ethanol, mass of ethanol, I'm going to use my density equation because I've got volume of ethanol and I've got a density. So density equals mass over, sorry, yeah, mass over volume. So therefore, mass is going to equal density times volume. So it's going to be 144, which is my volume, times my density. Now this is in grams per milliliter, which is the same as kilograms per liter. So therefore, if I times that by 7.79, I'm going to get my mass of my ethanol. So 100. I get my calculator out here. 144 times 0.79 is my mass of my ethanol, which is 113.76 kilograms. I need to divide that by my mass of my cellulose. So how's my cellulose? I've got a hundred, sorry, a thousand kilograms of this stuff here. I remember I've highlighted a percentage up here. So what percentage is this? That means that 37% of this stuff is cellulose. So I need to my, my mass of my cellulose equals 0 0.37 because it's 37 percent of a thousand which equals 370 kilograms. So therefore my percentage is going to be equal to 113.76 divided by 370 which is going to be equal to something. So therefore I go 370 divided by answer because I have my answer in there already equals that's not right, other way around. Um, so let's go back to working at this. 144 times 0.79 equals this. So therefore I divide that by 370 equals, so it's going to be 0.307 equals 30.7%. Now let's look for significant figures. I've only got two significant figures there, so therefore I'm going to go 31% here. So that should be my percentage by mass. That's a random question, but fun in terms of playing around with calculations. Knowing that I have my density, it means I need to work out density. I've got a volume of stuff, so that's where I'm going to work out my density from. Percentage by mass, um, playing around with it and knowing that percentage by mass is simply just percentage mass divided by mass. So therefore, I go through my process here. Um, percentage, actually, I should have a times by 100 because that's what you have to do when you get to percentage, um, and that's there. Anyway, moving on. Uh, calculate the amount of energy in kilojoules that would be produced if complete combustion of that many litres of ethanol occurred. So energy is going to be equal to my... Um, 
well, number of moles times delta H, or my mass times my energy density, which I can find in my, uh, what's it called, data booklet. So I can work out that fact that my mass of ethanol was 113.7 kilograms. I need to find that multiplied out by my density of ethanol. So I'm just going to go get my data booklet. Here it is here. And let's find my energy density, which is here. So my energy density, if I go look at this, I've got that much um, kilojoules per gram. So therefore, if it's 29.7 um, kilojoules per gram, so that's 29.6, sorry, 29.6 kilojoules per gram, I can times that by a thousand to get to my kilojoules per kilogram. So, because I've got kilograms here, so I need to make sure my units match up. So remember that as well. So, anyway, let's play around with this, and I get one one three point seven six times by my twenty nine point six times by a thousand, and that's going to give me a whole lot of kilojoules. So it's going to be three, three, six, seven, two, nine, six kilojoules. Now that's going to be equal to, um, it's in kilojoules and I need it, so that's good. So therefore that's going to be equal to 3.37 times 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 kilojoules. And there should be my energy produced from this much energy ethanol, I believe. Alrighty, let's move on. Okay, and last question here is, ethanol can be added to petrol to make E10, type of fuel containing 10% ethanol. Explain why E10 is more viscous, viscous is a key word for intermolecular forces, than regular petrol under the same conditions. Well, E10 contains ethanol, which has the hydroxyl functional group, OH, um, functional group. That's really poorly written, hydroxyl functional OH group. Anyway, um, this can form hydrogen bonds because obviously viscous refers to intermolecular forces, so I need to talk about hydrogen bonds with my ethanol, that are much stronger than the dispersion forces um, shown in regular petrol as regular petrol is a hydrocarbon. I'm um, just adding that in there to highlight the fact that we're comparing the two things. So explain why we have a more, this is a comparison question. E10 contains ethanol because we know that and viscosity means we're talking about functional groups and intermolecular forces. So therefore hopefully that does it. Ideally, this question I haven't answered really well. I probably would have liked to highlight this in terms of dot points. Um, first dot point really is this part here. Um, the fact that E10 um, contains ethanol and has a hydrogen bonds. Um, and the second point is the fact that these are much stronger. Um, so second dot point would be this. These are much stronger than the dispersion forces. So talking about both functional groups for my two marks there. Anyway, um, that's that question done, and I'll hopefully get around to doing the rest of the exam at some stage.